Well, we are, so, uh, we are so excited to see all of you here tonight. This is just fantastic. Um, we are here to listen and hear and learn the story, the amazing story, of Abe Mizminski and his uh, enterprises here in Ames, his grocery stores and all of the other things that he did. Um, Tom, do you have the proclamation? We just have a, a couple of things we want to do first. Um, I am Kathy Speck from the Ames Historical Society, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Misminski family. Uh, we'll be hearing from several members of the family and several special guests as the evening goes on. But prior to that, we want to uh, present to the family the proclamation signed by Mayor Ann Campbell, recognizing and thanking Abe Misminski and his family for their many contributions to Ames. Do you want to come up, Tom? Ed Norton, I think that means one or the other of you. My name is Tom Emerson. I went to high school with Ed, known him since 1952 or something like that. And anyway, it occurred to us that it would be a good idea to uh, uh, recognize belatedly Dave's contributions and Dave's over 40 years. And so I thought, I'm going to get a certificate from the city. And so I went down and I said, can we get a certificate honoring, recognizing the name? And they said, yes, yes, yes. And I said, but there's one thing. I said, what? There are no whereases in my certificate phrase. What? No whereases? We don't do we don't do certificates unless they have a lot of whereases in it. <laughs> So this is truly unique, guys, and it's also unique because there are two of them. One because I spelled Fanny F-A-N-N-Y, <laughs> and, and the other I got it right. So uh, we'll present at the moment uh, one certificate. What it does is it says, it's real simple, nowhere as it. Uh, the City of Ames honors uh, Abe and Fanny Mizvinsky for everything they did for the community and its residents from 1933 to 1978. Signed by Ann Campbell on behalf of the following mayors. And then I have the names and terms of service for every mayor who was uh, around when Abe and Fanny were uh, doing business. So you guys can, can arm wrestle over this. You can share it. Before we start our storytelling, and as uh, the special members of the audience were going to come up and speak, uh, before they come up, we thought that it would be fitting for all of you to hear a few words in Abe's own voice. Now, back in 1975, uh, WOI famous radio personality Doug Brown interviewed Abe rather extensively. And we have an archival copy of that wonderful 1975 interview with Abe. And so I'm going to play just a very short piece so that you can really get a feel for what this man was like. He, of course, uh, immigrated from Russia. And he had a thick accent his whole life. And um, I'm going to tell you in advance what Abe is saying because you may not pick it up right away. It just takes a little practice listening to Abe's voice. Abe says, it was just much different, the time from my country to this country, between United States and Russia, like between hell and heaven. Hell, you could call it, Hell, you could call it over there, heaven up here. There was just so much different the time when I come to this country between the United States and Russia, like between hell and heaven. Hell, you could call it over there and heaven up here. Could you pick up some of that? It was just much different, he said. The time from my country to this country, between the United States and Russia, like between hell and heaven. Hell, you can call it over there, heaven up here. So with that as an introduction, I'm going to introduce 
Norton Mazinski, eighth son. He'll be followed by Ed Mazinski, Abe's other son. And then we'll hear from Ted Couser, who lived next door to Abe and Fanny on Ninth Street here in Ames, and was able to witness a lot of comings and goings. And then um, Rabbi Metzger, uh, whose grandfather came to visit Abe here in Ames from New York City. And then finally Gary Greiner, who was the uh, store accountant for Abe during many years. Now, when we're finished with these formal uh, remarks, we would love to hear stories from you. And I wanted to just ask a show of hands, how many people in the audience knew Abe personally? How many people in the audience worked in one of Abe's stores? Got a few of those. A few of those. <laughs> Is there anybody in the audience who was the beneficiary of generosity of Abe's, alone perhaps? Uh, or some other generosity? Thank you. Norton? Uh, on behalf of, uh, although my brother can and will speak for himself, uh, <laughs> on behalf of both my brother Ed and myself, and I also want to say, on behalf of my of our two older sisters who passed away some years ago, and on behalf of our dear mother, we're honoring our father, Abe Mississippi, but uh, the glue of that family, uh, internally and sometimes externally, uh, was our mother. And so I also uh, want to say on behalf of our mother, uh, we want to thank all of you, all of you for coming here uh, this evening. Uh, we also want to thank the Ames Historical Society, Kathy Speck, uh, and uh, all, of her, uh, all of her colleagues uh, for all of the work that they did in putting this program together. Now, as many of you may know, uh, our father, Abe Mismas, he was one of the three million, estimated three million Jews who came from Eastern Europe to the United States between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of World War I. But in one way, he was, maybe in many ways, but in one way that I want to mention, he was different from a good many of the others. And he told us this often in the family. He said that when he came to the United States, an Orthodox religious Jew, one thing he wanted to do was he wanted to be able to live as an Orthodox religious Jew, not just among Jews, which had been the case when he was in, in Russia in the shtetl or the small town. He wanted to live among non-Jews and be able to still be a practicing religious Jew, but to be able to really have his community be a community that was made up of non-Jews as well. So I thought that would be a very good way for me to start uh, what I'm going to say about our father. Now he came to St. Louis, as you saw. He came into Galveston. He went to St. Louis. He was about 16. And he had a sister in St. Louis, and he had a brother in St. Joseph, Missouri. Both of them had come over previously. So he went to St. Louis, and when he got there, uh, some friends got him a job in a shoe factory. Then I think it's now, St. Louis had shoe factories. He went to work, he couldn't speak English then, hardly at all. So he spoke to the man next to him in Yiddish, and he asked the man how long he'd been working in this, in this uh, shoe uh, factory. The man said five years. He asked him, how much did you earn when you started? The man told him. He said, how much are you earning now? The man said the same. My father quit that day. <laughs> <laughs> he then went to St. Jones, uh, and uh, where uh, his brother Sam, my uncle Sam, of course, uh, lived. And he, Sam was peddling fruits and vegetables in the street. So my father peddled fruits and vegetables in the street as well. Uh, and uh, he did rather well. By the way, he learned English in the street, and he used to tell us these wonderful stories about how he learned English. He, he learned it, of course, from his customers, but I'll just tell you one of the stories. 
He said there was one woman who bought from him every day. And after a few weeks, she said to him, listen, Abe, before you come to me, in order for me to buy, you have to call me on the telephone so I can give you the order. And he said to her, I don't know how to use the telephone. She said, that's why I'm telling you, I want you to call me on the phone so you'll learn that and you'll learn English better. He learned English, he made some money, he met my mother, who had come with her family from Warsaw, Poland. They were in Kansas City, they got married, and then, when the Depression had hit, it was 1932, then around 1932, he said to my mother, listen, I, I understand that in the next state from here, Iowa, they have the best farmland in the country, and I or we Jews, we really were not able to have our own farms or our own businesses outside of our own little community in the old world. So I want to go there and I want to have a store and I want to buy a farm since I never could do that. So my mother said to him, listen, you've never been to Iowa. You don't know anything about it. You don't know anything about farming. My father stopped her and said, wait, the worst thing that can happen is we'll go to Iowa I'll lose all the money I have, but then you know, we can come back to St. Joe, and you know I can make a living peddling fruits and vegetables in the street. That's how we came to Iowa. So first he comes to Red Oak. That's where I was born. I was the first Jewish boy born in Red Oak. <laughs> and my father, he had to have one of my uncles, one of my mother's brothers, go to Omaha, Nebraska, to bring, we say in, uh, in Hebrew, we did the moil, the person to do the job religiously from Omaha, brought him. My father invited the whole town. Because they hadn't had a Jewish family. Of course, never a Jewish circumcision for an eight-day-old boy. Uh, so he invited the whole town, and the next day, newspaper front page, first Jewish boy born in Red Oak. So then, from Red Oak, he was there two years, he started a fruit and grocery, he didn't buy a farm yet, and then he came to Ames. Then he came to Ames. Late 1933, he came to Ames and he started the first store in Ames. Many of you know, maybe a whole of you know, where it is, where it was, on 2nd and Elm. So he started that store. He ended up having three stores in Ames. Uh, he also bought a farm. He did buy a farm. And then, for many, many years, in terms of farms, my father, as some of you I'm sure know, he bought and sold farms. And there are a lot of amazing stories about that. Sometimes, he would buy a farm sight unseen. Why sight unseen or almost sight unseen? He would drive, and if he drove in a part of Iowa, there was a farm in Britt, Iowa, that I know this happened to, because I used to drive him up there. If he saw that there was farmland that wasn't farmed very well, but the weeds were very high, he figured he could buy that farm for a low price because of the weeds, but if the weeds grew, crops could grow. So he then would offer a price and say, I'm going to offer this price without even looking at the land, figuring he could get it for less. Well, he bought and sold a lot of farms, and almost needless for me to say, he did pretty well with that. But let me come to the stores now. First store here, then his second store was Nevada. He had stores in Nevada, three of names later the other two. Uh, he had a store in Fort Dodge, he had stores in uh, Lamar's, he had store, a store uh, in, uh, he had a store in Cherokee. He ended up having seven, to eight, seven or eight stores, and of course, he did fairly well in those stores, uh, in those stores as well. Now, uh, my father, as many of you know, uh, I'll just say a few, few words about this. He was a very humble man, actually. And uh, uh, very, uh, very humble in lots of ways. Even humble, of course, uh, in the way he dressed and the way he held himself. I remember when I used to work in the store, Second and Elm, we called it the old store. I remember that often we always joked about this. A salesman would come in the store and would go up to one of the employees and say, a salesman who didn't, had never been to the store, would say, well, who's the boss or who's the owner? And so, the, uh, the employee would say, right over there, and there was my father, 
He'd be in the fruit department with his apron on, trimming lettuce or getting rid of the ripe bananas and so on. And of course, the salesman could hardly believe that was the owner. But that tells you something about my father. And of course, with clothes, well, my mother always, we knew this from my mother. My mother, every day, put the clothes out for my father to, for my father to wear. Because she said if she didn't do that, he'd wear the same pants and the same sweater for 30 to 40 days. <laughs> now, I'll tell you one other story uh, uh, about this, and then I'll get on to really the, more of the meat of it. When my father, he was fairly successful, he had managers in the stores, and the managers did well with him. And sometimes people would say to him, listen, why is it that your managers are all driving Cadillacs and you're driving the lowest price Buick or the lowest price Oldsmobile? And his answer always was, they can afford to drive Cadillacs. <laughs> now, so that gives you, some, that gives you uh, a little bit of uh, that, part, uh, that part of my father. Uh, but now I want to come to, uh, for us in the family, and for lots of other people, and I'm sure for many of you in this audience, really perhaps the single most significant thing about our father, Adrian Smith. He was not only kind, he was also a most charitable person. A most charitable person. And if I had about two days, I could fill those days with stories that really illustrate how charitable he was, how charitable he was. But uh, I'll only uh, mention, uh, I'll only mention a couple of those. One day, my father came home for lunch, and he said to us, we were all around the table for lunch, and he said to us, uh, the bank manager called me, that was Union Story Trust and Savings Bank. He said, the bank manager called me, and he wants to see me this afternoon. So then he came home in the evening, and then he told us why the bank manager wanted us. The bank manager told him, listen, Abe, tomorrow the state bank examiner is coming to the bank to examine all of our loans. And we have some loans out there that we like, but they don't have enough collateral. And the, and the state inspector is going to tell us, we're going to have to call in those loans. And the bank manager said, I really don't want to do that. So we said, Abe, if you would co-sign those notes, if the state bank inspector sees Abe Medzvinsky's signature as the co-signer, then those loans are, and the bank manager told him, they're strictly kosher. They're really, really <laughs> So my father said, I'll do it on one condition. What was the condition? You take all the papers of the loan, and you cover all the names before I sign. So I sign anonymously, so I don't even know the names of the people for whom I'm signing. Well, that tells you one story. That's one story uh, about my father. And then, of course, there are many others. I saw a few of you hold your hands up uh, when uh, Kathy asked you, uh, well, how many people were helped out personally by Abe Zvinsky? Well, as you know, there were probably hundreds of people. He would sometimes, and employees in his stores, uh, well, they always were helped. If one of them needed a new car, or if one of them needed a new house, let alone others who needed a new house, but they didn't have the funds, and, uh, and they didn't have the credit rating to get funds from the bank, my father would loan them the money. He actually had a crew that would all actually build many of the houses. And then he would say to those people, you'll pay me back without any interest, without any interest, as you can pay. And so uh, and that went on for, uh, well, uh, almost all of the time, uh, almost all of the time uh, that I was growing up. And I'll tell you one other story. And if you saw some of those displays out there about hobos, well, uh, this is a story that I'm sure also a good many of you know about. My father used to not only always give, then we had lots of hobos, as you may know. Hobos. Uh, 
I mean, they would travel around and come in. They came into our stores as well as other stores. And it was well known that my father's stores, they would always get some food. Uh, but that's that's only this part. My father, and they knew this, my father and they knew this one. My father told every manager of his store, he said, when one of these people comes in, and a person like this who is hungry, if you're waiting on your very best customer, you leave your best customer, and you go to that person, and you give that person not enough food for one meal. You give that person enough food for three meals. Now, I'll tell you a person who related that story to my father again, and to me, one time that I was a senior in high school and was driving my father to a farm uh, that he had in Britt, Iowa. And my father used to pick up hitchhikers. Not so much when my mother was in the car, <laughs> like that, but, but he would pick up hitchhikers. So here was this caricature, really, of a hobo. You know, we had the stick and he had the, the bag on the stick and he was standing there. My father said, pick him up. So he got in the back seat. I'm driving. When I heard this story, I almost drove right off the road. I'm driving. I'm driving. And so the man said to my father, hello, eight. <laughs> so my father used to have a habit of sort of doing this to his chin. And he said, you know, I'm not very good with names. No, the man said, Abe, you don't know me, but we all know you. <laughs> so my father said, listen, uh, thank you very much. But who is we? He said, all the hobos who come through central Iowa, because we know in all your stores, and then he said, what well, I just told you. Uh, uh, we know that, and so on. And also, my father, for a few years, had already been giving all of the meat for the hobos. I don't know if they still have this, but they have a convention. They still do a convention in Britt, Iowa, and they used to make a great big stew, and my father would always give them all the meat for that stew. So he knew that, and he said, Abe, he said, I know how much you're worth. <laughs> my father said, wait a minute. He said, you know, if somebody asked me how much I was worth, I'd have to stop and think for quite a while. I don't have it written down. I'd have to think for quite a while about what the answer is. This one almost drove off the road. The man said, look, let's do this. You take out a piece of paper and you mark down a number and you hold it in your hand. And I will give you a number, and then you open it up and you tell me if I'm right. How does that God this happen? The man wrote the number down. My father said, You are exactly right, and his son Norton started swerving. <laughs> well, I mean that. And then there is of course the story of we call them the Mishalah, the rabbis from the United States, very orthodox rabbis, uh, um, looking as they looked, uh, very religious, who would come to Ames whenever any of them came to Des Moines, where as you know, there's a Jewish community to collect some funds. Without exception, they would always make a special trip to Ames to see Abe Mizvinsky. Why? Because he gave to all of them, to all of them. So, um, uh, they would come, they would come uh, to Ames, and um, my father would always give, and some of you may also know this, uh, that sort of was sort of the talk of the town, because when they come, they would usually walk on the street, so people would see them, and everybody knew that these were the rabbis who were coming to collect for charity, and they were coming to see Abe. It was sort of a story, as some of you may know, throughout the town. My father gave to all of them. One day, at dinner, my mother asked my father, listen, you give to all these people, and to a lot of other people as well, and to a lot of other causes, but she said, you don't check into it. You don't check into uh, uh, these people. Maybe some of them, aren't quite what they say they are, and so on. My father said, listen, he said, if we put down how, uh, uh, how much I earn in a year, and then we put down how many hours I work in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year, and then we determine how much each 
working hour of my time is worth. If we did that, and if we did that, and we then uh, tried to decide how many hours it would take me to investigate all these people, he said, I'm even money ahead doing what I do. And he said, and he said even if I weren't money ahead, I would do it because here is the here. Is the he said, if only 10%, I'll never forget. He said, if only 10% of everything I do goes for good, then I have done a big mitzvah. That, as Rabbi Metzger can tell you, is even, it means commandment, but it really means uh, uh, one of the very best things that any person can do. So we said 10% would be a big mitzvah, would be a big mitzvah. Now, let me now tell you a more recent story. Rabbi Metzger was my rabbi. Uh, is here, and I joined the synagogue a few uh, uh, years ago. That's an interesting story in and of itself. But anyway, um, uh, was it three or four years ago? Three or four years ago, uh, his uh, the, the Rabbi Metzger's father-in-law and his mother-in-law came to visit for the weekend. Uh, his father-in-law is the chief rabbi in the Vancouver area. So they came, and of course, I never met them. And we have services Friday night when the Sabbath starts. And we have a group that always is there. And of course, Rabbi Nefter's father-in-law came. And then we have what we call a kiddush afterwards, where people, you bless the wine, and you have a, a cake or something else, and you talk. So I forget what they were talking about, but uh, they were, everybody was talking. And I said, what, whatever it was, I said, we didn't do it quite that way in Ames Island. His father-in-law, whom I never met, said, you're from Ames, Iowa? Just a rabbi from Vancouver, Canada. I said, yes. He said, did you ever know a person named Abe? <laughs> well, did you ever know a person named Abe? I said, there was only one Abe. <laughs> That's my father. Well, you know, he hugged me and kissed me. It's not the end of the story. It was Friday night, so he wouldn't talk on the telephone that night. But Sunday, Rabbi Metzger had a party. It was a party for his son. Uh, and uh, of course, I went to the party. And so at the party on Sunday after the Sabbath, the rabbi, Rabbi Metzger's father-in-law, called me aside, took out his cell phone. And he said, I'm going to call my father in Vancouver, who's in his middle 90s, and he's also a rabbi. And in the 1960s and 1970s, he used to travel the country to collect money, and he always came back and told us, the most charitable man that I have ever met in this world is Abe Mesvinsky in Ames, Iowa. So, so his father-in-law calls his father, and his father-in-law says, listen, Abe and Ames. So his father-in-law said, Abe Mesvinsky. He said, it's amazing, I have a son here. So he puts me on the phone, and what do I hear from this rabbi in his 90s? He said, well, you know, he told me how nice it was talk with me and that. But then he said, I'll tell you a story that your father told me in your house in Ames, Iowa. That's nice and up, 105 nights. We went to the house today to look through it again. But anyway, he said, here's the story. He said, one day I had come to Ames, and I went to your house, and I was talking with your father, and I asked your father, listen, why are you so charitable? And here was the answer. He said that my father told him that when he was very, very young, and still in this little step for this little town in Russia, he was studying with his religious teacher. And, he, and his religious teacher said to him, told him the story of Abraham, one of the stories of that Abraham had a tent in the desert, and in that tent, he had four openings or four doors for every direction, so anyone who was hungry and tired from any direction coming through the desert could come into the tent and would be fed and would be able to relax and so on. So my father said, when I was very young, he said, I told myself that if I could afford it, I would always be like that for the rest of my life. Well, that rabbi 
from Vancouver, Canada, in his 90s, he told me one story about my father that I had never heard before. Well, that story uh, also uh, indicates something again about my father. Now, uh, uh, actually, I'm, oh, I'm getting wound up. I'm just starting to wound up. <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you so many stories uh, about my father, but I'm sure my brother had something to say. Uh, and uh, there are others of you. Uh, Ted Kuzer has something to say. Uh, there are others of you, I'm sure, who also have something, would like something, that would like to say something about my father, and we all like to hear it. So again, what I really want to end with is, I want to thank you all again for coming here this evening to help me and my brother and all of us celebrate the memory of our father, Ignaz Vinsky. And um, in his humble way, in his humble way, and in his non-assuming and enormously charitable way, he symbolized some of the best that, as I see it, that humanity has to offer. And actually, I consider myself blessed to be the son of a man like Abe Mismans. Thank you. I was the youngest of four. So by the time I showed up on the scene in Ames, my father had a specialty, and some of you know, and that was selling bananas. <laughs> you probably knew about the bananas. And he not only would have people sell bananas and you would walk out with dozens of bananas because you got a special. <laughs> and he prided himself on being special. But not only did he have to realize that, but he then took his son and said, son, somebody would come by the produce counter and he'd wear the apron. And he would wear the apron and say, well, you know, the bananas are 10, 12 cents. You want a son for seven cents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was the youngest, so maybe I'm expendable. No! <laughs> but growing up in Ames, which are my roots, these are my roots, and I want to say to all of you here, I'm proud that I've come back to my roots. I've come back to Ames. And as you know, I gave my papers to Ames, and part of those papers includes what it was like to grow up in Ames. And what it was like to experience life and the whole experience of growing up in the Midwest. And you know, I'll touch on my mother and what it was like, yes, for my father, who guided my mother. Yes, she laid out the clothes, but my mother, we would go to Des Moines for our religious education. And to our religious education, we would hop on a bus. And it was like going cross country because you would hop on the Greyhound bus and they would say, all aboard for Huxley, Inc. and Carney, Marketsville, Des Moines. You thought you were going from California to New York. And I would take that bus, then hop on a trolley, go to a house, and we would study the Bible in the Old Testament. And then I would hop on that bus at night, go on the back seat, and fall asleep. And then I'd come home, and my mother, and our mother, who made this possible, would have a big egg sandwich, large chocolate milk, and she'd be sitting at the table, typing in Braille for the blood. Not only in English, 
but she typed the Old Testament in Hebrew. So I remember that, and that not only made an impact on me as an individual, but obviously affected our whole family. And my brother mentioned, yes, my father had a penchant for, for looking at farms and buying them sight unseen. And we would have people walk into the back room of the store and describe the land. And then we would go to the farms. And I remember, we would go to the farms and the farmers would raise not only soybeans, but we had turkeys and we would drive up and the turkeys would come be around the car and he'd tell me, honk the horn, Andy. He called me Andy. <laughs> Some people still call me a few things. <laughs> but he would tell me that, honk the horn, and the turkeys would gobble, gobble like a Greek chorus. <laughs> and we grew up with that environment. We grew up being proud to be an Ames. We grew up of our heritage and our family legacy. And we knew the value of what it was like to cherish our human rights as people. And so really tonight, and it's wonderful to see you here. It's wonderful to see this crowd to remember our family, but also to remember the heritage of what this country is all about and what we stand for. And my brother described the humility and the value of charitable life, the value of human rights, the value of having hope. And that's really what he instilled in us as human beings. To value our heritage, to look at what is important in life and put a value on that. And that's really, I think, the significance of what you hear. Yes, we had our, we had our lives, we grew up in Ames, and yes, I competed in athletics. My father wondered, because it was Friday night, and you know, Friday nights in athletics, he really had a difficult time coming. And fortunately, the team did well, and finally, the games were not always on Friday nights. And you know, the Ames team seemed to be doing pretty well right now, right? They're now undefeated, the high school team. But then, to show you what my brother points out about the value of, of economics, is when I told my father that I decided that perhaps maybe I would run for public office. You know what he had to say? He said, well, can you make any money in politics? <laughs> and I said, well, if you're honest, no. So what did he say? So why do you want the aggravation? <laughs> Well, take a look at what's happening now. There's a lot of aggravation. But really, I just want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with the thought that all of you that have had some connection with our family, and those of you that have cherished the life in Iowa and what it represents is really symbolic of what my father and mother instilled in us as human beings. And it was very moving for us today to show up at 105 9th Street, in the brick house. And if you look at a lot of the brick houses in Ames, they were built by our family. And we walked in that house, very humble, very small. We shared bathrooms. We shared our life together. We had our grandmother live with us, and that grandmother living with us, we know that because I came back here and I, and I experienced with the doors a grandmother and what it's like. It's that experience that's really to be cherished and what hopefully we've learned, not only growing up in Ames in the 50s and 60s, but hopefully that story that way of life, that understanding, which my brother described and which I lived and is privileged and proud. Yes, I'm proud to be born in Mary Greeley Hospital. <laughs> but you know, before long, as one person said, Ted, it looks like the hospital's going to take over the town. <laughs> so I just want to say this. 
on behalf of our family and to all of you, thank you. Thank you for making our life better. Thank you for instilling a spirit of generosity and hope and a way of life that I carry forth for the rest of my life. And hopefully here there's family, there's children and there's grandchildren that are here that will hear this story and your children and your grandchildren can take that message. And yes, I've come home again to my father, my mother, and our family. Thank you for letting us come home again to Ames Island. and uh, I had the great privilege of growing up right next to this remarkable family. Um, I'm not going to be up here very long. I, I have lots of wonderful memories about those years. Um, I was saying to Eddie earlier tonight, that, uh, or in Norton, that uh, one of the things that I remember most fondly was uh, their mother's yellow pound cake with a sponge cake. Uh, must have had two dozen eggs in it and a pound of sugar. Um, it, was, it was really quite marvelous. Uh, our neighborhood there, you know, uh, Ames is a, is a marvelous place to grow up. Um, we had wonderful schools here and everything, but our neighbor, our neighborhood there was so unusual. Um, here we had the Rusminskis, very accomplished family. Around the corner on Douglas Avenue, Nick Nolte was growing up. Uh, the actor Nick and Nancy. Nancy was in my class. Nick was uh, my sister's age. Bob Bartley would go on to be the editorial page editor. The Wall Street Journal was around the corner in another direction and everything. And it was just a, it was a magical time. Um, I'm going to close with one little story on Eddie that, that my mother used to tell. Um, my uncle, uh, my father's older brother, Harold, um, worked at Iowa State College, and he uh, was occasionally on WI radio. The studios were right in the same building where he worked. And when Eddie and I were little boys, we played together often, and we happened to be at my house one day, and we were playing on the living room floor, and Mother was doing some sort of work nearby, and um, she said she overheard us talking, and Eddie said, my father has a thousand farms. And I, and I said, and my uncle is on the radio. <laughs> it's wonderful to be back in my hometown and to be a part of this. I want to thank the Mitchells for including me in this wonderful event. And uh, glad to see you all. And, and, uh, some, some old friends of mine among you. So thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> I guess I'm the last one here. Uh, to tell you my viewpoints of what uh, I did with the agency. I was an employee, and actually I was uh, a uh, controller or a copy uh, for things through the grocery. The time I started, I started uh, uh, second and L, started uh, school a little bit, and uh, uh, they put me in an office in the back room, <laughs> and uh, it was up above, and a uh, couple of things, just to uh, let you know, uh, the manager there was Delbert Johnson, and then we had Ed Hayes as the meat manager, we had the formal vets, and uh, the uh, assistant manager, and we had another gentleman that was assistant beach manager, his name was uh, John Thurman. And that was kind of the team and when I started. And uh, a couple things that I enjoyed, and I'm, I want to thank Ed and, and Norton here that, tonight to, that I had an opportunity to talk. Uh, but uh, it, it was kind of one of those deals that I kind of took over the drive uh, things from uh, the, when I started. Uh, Ed was in Iowa City, and Norton was in the 
out east somewhere, and that's all it hurt. And uh, so I ended up driving hay around. And so we went to farms. And uh, some of these farms actually were up in uh, uh, northern Minnesota, and uh, a little bit of the Dakota Sea had one. So we would take a day or two, and you know, that drive, uh, I learned a lot about the Jewish religion. I learned a lot about a lot of things. And uh, one of the few things, uh, uh, it was just a great time. But we enjoyed each other. I uh, thoroughly thought he was uh, the most interesting person that I've run into. And i uh, learned a lot, and uh, not only about life as life it is, but how to look at people and how to enjoy them and how to make them you know, feel good about what they do. And that was through Jimmy and stuff. And uh, you talk about uh, he's done a lot of things for individuals. I'm one of them. Uh, just a short, quick story. Uh, I started with A, and uh, I actually came to, uh, built a house on Bar Drive for Dorothy. And uh, so, uh, I don't know exactly, but the house became F.D. after a while. And I don't know what the circumstances was there. But anyway, I got to move into the house. I had a family. I had a boy and a girl and a wife. And uh, lived there for about a year and a half. And he came to me and he says, Gary, I don't know why you're ready. And I said, well, because I can't find it. And he says, you find a house. And uh, so I did, and, he, and I, I said, you know, back then, it was a, a new house, and believe it or not, the house was uh, $16,000, unreal. And, you know, you can't buy a house, and it was on Johnson Street. And to, to the north of Johnson was Cornfield, St. Cecilia's, now built there and stuff, and that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, I, uh, came to him and the guy that had built the house, which was about a year old, he had done a bowl and the payment was $93, as I recall. But anyway, uh, to buy down to the bowl, it took about six grand. And I said, you know, I couldn't even fathom that kind of thing. I mean, that house was just over beyond my expectations. So anyway, one of the things that Abe says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll work out a deal for you. And everything was working out a deal and, and in his world. And he said, well, Gary, he says, go write a check. And I said, I cannot cover that. I don't even want to go there. And he said, write it, and I'll make sure you have the money. And uh, believe it or not, he did that. And uh, we went to the bank, and sure enough, I was a homeowner. First time in my life, and I was only about 24 years old, and that was unbelievable. Uh, 25, probably from there. And so, you talk about good things. I think he, uh, uh, you know, I can't say enough words that uh, would describe him, and uh, as we all have. Uh, but uh, anyway, just to get off of the story. Uh, at Second and Now, just to uh, give you a kind of a flavor of that, uh, that they gave allowed people to charge groceries. As, as, uh, so we, they charge. And then the, kind of the criteria of that is that if they had a family and had a job, they could charge groceries. And then they'd pay every time they get paid or whatever. And so he was way ahead of the curve with the credit card. <laughs> anything like that. So anyway, he allowed families to charge groceries. I know that at the end of the year, in the accounts I got, I'm saying, Abe, hey, we got a problem here, you know, and stuff. And he says, oh, let's go through. And we'd look at him and say, okay, this and this and this and this. And, this. and we'd come to one and I said, you know, the guy lost his job. He can't pay, he has a pay for a pawn or something. Dave says, hmm, well, he needs some help, doesn't he? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, 
and, and stuff. And so he took a look at the turkey and he just kind of flipped through it. And uh, all of a sudden, zip, zip, and they were thrown away. I said, yo, what are you doing? You know, what's this? He says, well, they needed the help. You call them up and say, forget, you know, they don't have to pay. And so, you know, there's some odd stories that a lot of people don't even know that happened that being an accountant to work at that store. Well, anyway, let's get back to the driving boat thing. I got a little episode that uh, I wanted to tell you about. It's one of my kind of favorite stories and stuff. And uh, I was at second in Elm and, uh, and uh, we he I had something and then I came up to talk to him in the uh, fruit department and stuff. And then he went up and sacked some groceries because there was some groceries there in the sack. And uh, he says, you know, Gary, he says, I got to go somewhere. And uh, he said, obviously, he liked his Buick. And it was parked out front in the parallel parking out there. And so there was a car in front of him and a car, well, he must put a, a little Volkswagen Beetle behind him. And so anyway, I'm sitting there and I'm sacking groceries. And all of a sudden, I, I told Abe, I said, you know, it's kind of a tight spot. Maybe you better wait until somebody goes or something like that. He said, no, i got to go right now. And I said, whoa, OK. So he gets in the car, and all of a sudden you hear the tire screeching, and the front car moves forward about two feet. <laughs> so I'm saying, whoa! You know? So we're all standing at the window at the second now looking out. And uh, one of the other things is then he gets it and throws it in reverse. And while the snow boat's wagon and beat all, I don't know if you know if you realize, but they had on the bumper they had two little prongs that stuck up about eight high. So the Buick is a little bit higher. Also have a beetle, a little bit smaller. So all of a sudden we hear this crash. And he's got the beetle hooked on his bumper. He's pulling out. Right. And this beetle is falling right. and stuff, and it stops. And I said, okay. He says, get that thing off my car. And so we, you know, I jump on the car and stuff to get, that, get it off, put it off the bumper, and he pulls forward. And he stops, and he's, I said, Abe, hey, you know, what are we going to do here? And he says, you go in and find the people that own this thing, and these two cars, and he says, you run them down to Ray Wishon's body shop. And he says, Ray will fix it for me. So he says, and then you go down and pay the bill. <laughs> well, but anyway, that was kind of one of those slides. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't remember the days, but we remember the moments, I guess, in this case. And so it's kind of one of those deals that uh, it's just, you know, memories are all over the place. Especially when you drive to Kansas City, going down to see Minna and uh, Saul. And actually, Paul, I don't know the kids in English, Gay High when I was running around. I see him here tonight. But anyway, uh, it was kind of one of those uh, 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 times that I took over the driving because Ed and Norton weren't there. <laughs> so, but anyway, it was an enjoyable time. Uh, Abe did so many things on a handshake. He looked at the person, found out what their needs are, says, hey, what do you need? And what can you pay? Kind of one of those deals, he shook the hands, and there was no documentation. I would make documentations, but he never. You know? <laughs> and so we knew who, who's what. But you know what? He helped a lot of businesses in town uh, to get going. He had his own team of people. If he wanted something built or somebody was building something, he would get people together like Rich Coy, uh, Phil Coy, some of those guys, and all these uh, people that uh, 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 was in that type of business. And they said, well, we're putting up an, uh, an apartment house. Well, they put one up, it's called Tenra. Uh, anyway, uh, several things like that. Because they needed some work, we were going to build up. So, uh, so 
I guess what I look at there is that he was a guy that uh, had a wonderful uh, heart, I guess is what you say, and, and was able to recognize people and trusted people, which we sometimes don't have today, and, and uh, trust people for what they are. And, so it is what it is and so forth. But anyway, I just feel very privileged, very happy I could be a part of this. And uh, I thank the family for having me here. And I thank everybody that came. The family really would like it, and I know I'm looking at my watch too, but the family really did want to hear a few stories if there was someone who would be willing to tell a one or two. You got one here? And I'll try to run the microphone around. Your name is? Leonard Anderson from Story City. I knew him for a long, long time. You know, for uh, one thing about Abe, he cared and he shared. Let's turn that around. He shared because he cared. But uh, it was not what was in his hip pocket, it was what was in his heart. My opinion of Abe was that he's one of the greatest people I've ever walked with. Nelson Smith, I am Abe's grandson. I am Dorothy's son, that's Abe's eldest daughter, and I could go on with many, many memories I want. One time, my grandfather on my father's side came out, they were very good friends, Abe and my grandfather on my father's side were very good friends. And Boyd, who was my father's father, came out to visit the stores and Abe loved to walk around and show him the stores. And when they were in one of the stores, a gentleman got to the cash register and by the time it got rung up, he didn't have enough to finish paying for the bill that was on the register. So the little cashier said, well, I can't, I'm sorry, sir, I can't bag up your groceries until they're paid for. And Abe overheard that, and he said, ran over to the cashier and says, you bag those up right now. And so later on, during the dinner, my grandfather on my father's side, Boyd, said, what was that all about? And Boyd's, and I guess this gets to the part of Boyd's generosity, he said, in one sentence, I remember when I was hungry. I'm Fred Bolton, originally from Gilbert. Um, as a youngster, I remember going to the grocery store occasionally with my mother, not too often. Apparently, it must have been a Friday or Saturday. I would say more of Saturday. I just remember Abe always having that sweater on. Same sweater. <laughs> I don't remember him having an apron too often, but every once in a while he did. But he was always pushing bananas, for the sense it was at the end of the week. And then I would go back around by the meat department, and the, one of the meat guys back there would always hand me a wing 
would you like to have a win? Oh shoot, gotcha, I'm going to have a win. <laughs> and then I definitely remember my folks was one that was in charge of groceries, and the book was up toward the front, what, right, right of the door is where they kept the uh, books up there. And then, of course, they come and pay once a month and everything. But yes, I, I remember those days. <laughs> My name is Johnita Bell. I was uh, went to St. Cecilia's Church and he opened that store so we all could uh, get groceries after church. We had eight children and he knew that. And every day, every Sunday, I'd go in there and he'd give me an apron full of bananas or peaches that were too dry or anything like that to feed my family. And I really appreciate it. Swenson, um, Wes Johnson, Delbert Johnson was my dad, who worked for A for almost 30 years, manager at the first store on 2nd and Mill. And I grew up with A. Um, my sister is in California, or she would be here today too. She did send me a text, and I'd like to share a few things that she said. Um, after Ed and Norton had had gone to other places. Besides Gary driving, my dad also did a lot of driving, and there were a lot of fun stories that he would tell. Um, one that was my favorite, sis my sister's favorite, was um, that he was driving him, and they went to a farm, and when they got to the farm, Abe and Dad got out of the truck and went up and we were talking. And he said he'd like to buy the man's farm. And the man said, well, he looked at Abe and his big baby pants, and he said, well, if you could get some financing, we could talk. And Abe nodded at my dad, and my dad went back to the truck and carried back a, a brown paper bag with cash. <laughs> and Bart bought the farm. <laughs> right then, right there. Um, I remember I worked at the grocery store, my sister did too, for many, many years. And I candled eggs, my sister did, we did all sorts of things. And Abe, I can remember him not only trying to sell the bananas, but he tried to um, trade the bananas for children. <laughs> he would say, fortunately, Delbert, he would call my dad Delbert instead of Delbert. You know, I, I think we should make a trade here, and, and he wanted to give away a bunch of bananas for a child. <laughs> so, um, he totally enjoyed the customers. Um, we were trained that the customer was always right, and to help them no matter what. If that meant helping with food, or um, if there was any concern to always, people were first, and that was most important. Um, One more thing. <laughs> Trying to remember what my sister wanted to share. Um, oh, I, I my dad was Danish, but Abe started calling him his Norwegian Jew, <laughs> and my dad he called him Dalbert, but he was Johnson. He was no longer Johnson, he was Johnski. <laughs> and the very first year that they came up with it, that you could have a license plate that was personalized, my sister and brother-in-law got him one that said Johnski. <laughs> my dad loved that. I remember tears rolling down his face when he received it. And he drove that truck until almost a year ago when he died. So it always said Johnski. He carried that very proudly. It was a pressure to work with him. I'm Andrew 
moved to Whetstone. I worked at the old store, and we were financially very poor, <laughs> raising their kids. And I talked to Abe one day, knowing that we would like to buy the house, but we went for financing and we had no credit. And so Abe said, you have your husband come and talk to me. So my husband came over. I was thinking we just wanted to do some extra work for him. And he said, after he talked, he said, you meet me at the bank tomorrow morning. He said, at 8 o'clock. And my husband said, the bank doesn't open until 9. <laughs> and he said, you meet me in the alley. <laughs> <laughs> so we went in the alley at the bank. And he said, you me blank no. He signed his name. He said, you take care of him. And that's how we got our first house. I love the man dearly. <laughs> My name is Ken Cooper. I had a neighbor a number of years ago that had worked as driving a truck at the store. He told me one day that Abe was uh, in town someplace and he saw a guy with a truckload of farm gates, a whole truckload of them. He stopped and he asked the guy, he said, well, if I buy your whole load, would you deliver them to my farm? And I think the word was farm. Maybe I don't think I heard it right. So a week later, when the guy returned, he spent almost a whole week delivering those gates to Dave's uh, farms. Because he only had one or two go here and one or two go there. <laughs> and, uh, so that's uh, the story that I have heard as a, a young boy. And, uh, take just a couple more and um, if you have a story that you would really like to tell um, we are videotaping it we might just do uh, kind of a little one-on-one -on -one videotape okay. I am Mary McNam Hearns and I was born here in Ames uh, 96 years ago and I well remember Abe. I often visited him in his store. I found him so nice to visit with. I like to visit with people. And one day, he was telling me about, he was planning to build his new store up where the the company is. And I was, he was telling me about it. I said, well, how do you know what you want? He said, are, are you going to have an architect? What would I do with an architect? I know what I want. And I he said, I have no use for her. I will do it myself. And he did. He went ahead of me. He knew what he wanted. And he built a real nice store. <laughs> I'm Tom Emerson, and I, I collected some stories from classmates uh, about Abe. One was Dave Roach, who worked for Abe in a store, but he said, one of my mother's favorite stories involved Abe. She was selecting eggs from a bulk bin. Nate came over to her. After he filled up her bag, he whispered, just tell him it's a dozen, Mrs. Roach. <laughs> <laughs> she could hardly wait to get home and count the eggs. Yes, Tom. <laughs> there were exactly one dozen. <laughs> And this one's from Bob Bryan, another classmate, who had, uh, he said that after he got him out of college and went to Minnesota for a job, and he'd come home, his dad would go down to Abe's on Sunday and buy steak to barbecue. One Sunday morning, he writes, my father had purchased the steaks from Eddie the butcher, not, not, not our Eddie over there, I don't think, and was on his way to check out when he was approached by Abe. Mr. Bryan, he said, could I interest you in some day old bread? One third off. My father replied, Hey, what are you talking about? He said, 
uh, day old goods sell for uh, usual prices, one half off. He <laughs> put his arm around the Bob's father's shoulder, turned them both around to face the butcher, and said, Eddie, which one of us is the Jew? <laughs> My name is Ruthie Khan, and I live in Chicago now, but my story is about from Israel. Dave brought his mother-in-law, Baba Esther and his mother Beth, to see my grandmother's and sisters. My grandmother was 92, we had not seen each other for 65 years, and Dave promised his mother, Baba Esther, that he would bring her to his wife. We came and the two old ladies were singing songs and gave their family and my mother and I were just crying because of emotion. As a result of this, Abe was, Abe, and with the help of Norton Mizlinski, who was in Israel before that, told me that I can come here to study. And Abe sponsored me. And I came here to the University of, uh, the University of Iowa and I studied. And I spent my first summer with the Ames and I worked with the Ames band. <laughs> and it was a remarkable visit, and that's how he helped other members of the family all along. In addition to him, he reached his generosity, which did his When uh, when Abe opened the West Side store, uh, he ran a raffle, and there's been a little recreation of it out in the lobby. Uh, there were, <laughs> maybe Olivia needs to tell this story. Do you want to? Okay. So, I'm Olivia Madison, and my father is Carl Ardball, and I wish he could be here. He's not too far away. He lives in, in Green Hills, and he just isn't quite, this just would have been a little overwhelming for him. My father uh, came to Ames in 1952, and um, I was just a mere baby, <laughs> and I was born in Manhattan campus, not in Ames, but my father came to Ames. And he, uh, we used to shop at, you know, West Street Grocery, corner grocery store. And I'm telling you, when West Side Ames Fruit and Grocery opened, that was the place to go <laughs> in Ames. On the west side, it was a, it was unbelievable, and I, I would say, you know, I remember every once in a while, A would be there, and you know, I would be in awe of him. And boy, the, his, the bananas! I started remembering the bananas. <laughs> and um, but, but uh, Abe also was, you know, he was always ahead of the times, and I could tell from all these stories. So, um, but he had a contest. And he had, um, and I remember it as a child. My younger sister remembers it, Carla. And um, he had a contest, and there was a large container full of ping pong balls. I don't know if any of you remember this contest. But there was also, which we didn't recreate, um, a pole that had a ribbon wound around it and a big ball. And the contest was how many ping pong balls are in this container and the inches of the ribbon. Oh, my father is an engineer, <laughs> and he had a good friend who taught in the engineering graphics department who was from Egypt, Magni Bachter. And Magni was certain he was going to win this contest, and my father was a very sweet, unassuming man, but he was a little smarter than Magni Bachter. <laughs> At any rate, the prize was a beautiful coffee and tea set. Silver, silver, and that's if you, whoever was closest to winning, uh, to estimating both pieces, of, both parts of the contest, would get this um, uh, silver, this silver tea set. Well, I told Ed when we were negotiating and having a wonderful time and negotiating the very best sense of the word, um, his gift to the Iowa State University Library, his papers. I told them my story of my father and, and how my father just so respected his father, Abe, and that he won this tea set. Well, long story short, he, 
he did win the tea and it's out there, so please enjoy it. Um, you know, I, I spent the noon hour polishing it. <laughs> I haven't polished silver for a long time, but look at this. <laughs> this is just unbelievable. And uh, my mother, we had, a, in those days, um, we had formal dining rooms in, in homes. And this tea set was in the place of honor in our home, as long as I can remember. And every day I would look at it as a child growing up, and I would think of Abe in Ames Group Grocery, and the elegance that he gave our lives. And my mother's passed away. And about four years ago, on um, Christmas Day, uh, Christmas Eve, my father brought his present to me. And he said, Olivia, this is yours. So it's treasured in my memory. And it doesn't, it in no way really speaks to all of the generosity in what A did for so many people in so many lives. But he also gave a little bit of a romance and joy and beauty into lives as well. And uh, I am blessed to have this as a memory of a true entrepreneur and a man who knew his business and knew how to create excitement in this town. <laughs> Josephine, she's an Iowa State student, and she's been helping Ed uh, put together all the details in this, but she uh, has the winner. So even though we're not giving the silver tea set, <laughs> there's a bath and there's tea and coffee inside of it, and the winner is Al Holm with the guess of 115, and there was 113 balls in there. <laughs> story that you would love to tell for posterity, go alert near Alex there with the video camera and we'll just do a little short bit uh, for that. But thank you so much for coming and sharing. Good night. My name is Fern Kupfer. I'm telling a story for uh, Bill and Millie Valine about Abe Nitzvinsky. Millie was my babysitter for a long time for my special needs son. Bill used to talk about Abe Nitzvinsky. Uh, the Valines were so poor many years ago when they first got married that Bill said he used to eat squirrels all the time for four weeks. Uh, squirrels are very plentiful in Iowa in Ames. And uh, Abe Mizvinsky, when Bill was young, would say, uh, pay when you can. Everything was on credit, and there was never any interest. And he never asked him for anything in bit. And Bill always paid when he could. And he only had wonderful things to say about Abe Mizvinsky. I'm Bill LaGrange, and uh, I grew up in Ames. And I was a member of the Ames Qantas Club. We met Sheldon on the hotel on Fridays. And I was, one year I was appointed as chairman of the Apple Committee. And we sold apples to individuals around town. But I got the idea that we ought to sell them to the grocery stores as well. So I went down to see Amy. And uh, Amy visited with me a while and, and I was telling him about our program to sell them to the grocery stores. He said, uh, why don't you buy apples from me <laughs> rather than you buy that I buy apples from you? Anyway, 
That's why he, he, he was such a good entrepreneur. Thank you.